this is me and Electra. Ah. Child prodigy, pianist, composer, conductor, author, linguist, musicologist, historian, teacher, encyclopedist, quiz show contestant, and world traveler, Nicholas Slonimsky, at age 98, returned to his native Russia with daughter Electra and granddaughter Kate. Yes, I was astounded at the snow because it was late April that it should be snowing. Even in Russia, it was extraordinary. More than any other music figure of the 20th century, Slonimsky embraced all music, from the ridiculous to the sublime, popular to classical, and generations of composers and performers as diverse as John Cage and Frank Zappa became his friends. For 80 of his 100 years, he has been a major figure on the modern music scene in America and Europe. He returned to his native Russia as a guest of the government, as part of a week-long music festival in St. Petersburg, his hometown. Yes. Well, it feels sort of weird because, you see, I was born in St. Petersburg. I was born, to be exact, on uh, April 27, 1894. Even before he was born, his parents labeled him the genius of the family, their Newton chick, nicknamed after the physicist Sir Isaac Newton. Now, the word genius he has some very bad connotations in in my infancy because it, when I was an infant, uh, my mother told me I was a genius, but I didn't understand the word, and so the word genius got s some kind of a of a very unpleasant taste for me because I couldn't believe it. My mother would always say he's a genius or he's a talent in a very very low tone of voice and I thought it was something very bad and I wanted to be like other boys or girls. My friends, including my remarkable nephew, who is a, a wonderful composer, picked me up, and there was a reception committee and all kinds of things, and all, all of a sudden, he and others said that I was important. I denied it absolutely. I said I was not important, I was cold. And I feel that, that it's unfair for the Weather Bureau to arrange such a cold weather. You see, I had my home in, in a very warm country, California. Slonimsky lives alone in sunny Los Angeles, in a modest bungalow, with his cat, Grody to the Max, named in Valley Girl lingo by Moon Unit Zappa, rock star Frank Zappa's daughter. Famous as a teacher, he has entertained generations of students with his wit, his wisdom, and his bag of piano tricks. to be played with a 
was it an orange or 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 a, or a lemon? I planned to do it with an orange. They said an orange, but it turned out to be a lemon. So maybe my whole piece will turn out to be a lemon. Another thing I can do is to play the overture to Tannhäuser with a brush. Well, my piano studies proceeded very obviously. My aunt Isabel Vengerova was a famous piano teacher. She eventually went to America and uh, uh, she was one of the most important piano teachers at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. And among her pupils was Lenny Bernstein, for instance, Samuel Barber. If a person would play a note on the piano, then I would know exactly what note that was, and that was called perfect pitch. And that was something that seemed that only I and my aunt had. At the age of 14, Slonimsky entered the St. Petersburg Conservatory of Music. Glazunov, its director and famed Russian romantic composer, praised his talent. But the wunderkind had doubts about his genius conquering the world. I, I was for, uh, 17 years old, I believe, and that I apparently tried try to hang myself in the in the bathroom and so uh, since uh, the russian appointments were were not very very good so the whole thing collapsed and i began to cry or whatever it is and my mother decided that i had to to be taken to a hospital or to a psychiatric establishment and just why i did it and uh, it was just to attract attention. There is no other explanation. Petersburg definitely uh, in uh, 1917. Why? Because I was getting sick and tired of this situation when uh, we didn't know where we were going or coming or just what was going to happen during the revolution. Not that I was against the revolution, but I was against the situation where we didn't know where we where, where we were going, you know, and what the plan was. And I remember many s strange songs that people of the of the town sang. Uh, they were usually songs of uh, protestation against the former government and against possibly the future government. Pay the champagne, courage, joy. Then your last day will bourgeois. Now this is the actual song. Ta 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 ta
And I repeat the words, pay to champagne, drink your champagne, courage to joy, to nibble your little chicken. Then why последний, this is the last day of yours, you bourgeois person. Generally speaking, I was glad, in fact delighted, that there was a revolution in the German war which was still being fought, or that it was over and that all wars were over and that the Bolsheviks proclaimed all kinds of eternal peace, uh, universal peace and so forth, which didn't work out, of course. But I regret to say that uh, the situation generally was terrible. People were, were dying right and left. I remember that a friend of mine who was a music critic, uh, he sold his uh, great Bechstein piano for only uh, 12 pounds of Russian blood bread. Also, it was very sad for me to realize that animals were just disappearing, either they were dying or I just can't say it, but or they may have been even slaughtered by their own owners. Well, I'm a cat lover and I can't even think of anything, anything like that, that could happen. And then the last uh, decent piece of food that I had was a, a sandwich made of frozen vobla. It's a, uh, a, an Arctic uh, fish. And this is the only fish I could get in St. Petersburg at that, at that time. That was, I remember very clearly, the last piece of food I ever had in Petrograd. Slonimsky began a journey that would take him from Petrograd to Kiev, Kiev to Yalta, Yalta to Istanbul, Istanbul to Berlin, Berlin to Paris, and finally Paris to America. And then I could play the piano. I, and so that was really my salvation. So uh, then I, I got a job with the famous Russian conductor Kusevitsky as his piano player and also his arranger. Well, this, this was a technical matter which is difficult to explain to a to a non-specialist. Sikusevitsky uh, conducted this Le Sacre du Printemps, uh, an extraordinary work by uh, by Stravinsky, uh, but he couldn't make it right, just simply beyond Kusevitsky's capacity, and so he asked me to rearrange it so that he could just uh, beat time uh, uh, according to his uh, accustomed ways. And so I helped him in that. Now, what happened is that uh, he told a number of people in sort of a boasting way that he hired a musician who was also a mathematician. This was uh, on his part, at Kusevitsky's part, of the boasting about having a surf you know, a samba, uh, who could do all kinds of things. You could play the piano, that's mean. mean. You could learn languages, which of course I did, and Kusevitsky could not learn any foreign language, no matter what. And so uh, there was this uh, conflict of personalities, and finally uh, Kusevitsky decided that I was not a person to uh, have around, and and to tolerate my being a smart, smart aleck, which I undoubtedly did, was. In fact, I enjoyed it very much. 
And all of a sudden, I said to myself, why don't I try to conduct, conduct new pieces that, that nobody would touch? And so I uh, started a little orchestra in Boston, especially for uh, modern American music. At that time, modern amus American music was Charles Ives and Henry Cowell and and also Edgar Varese was a Frenchman, but they were all modern composers whom nobody would touch because they were so advanced. Now, of course, they are practically classics. So I had, had this feeling that well, I told you so, which incidentally was unfortunately part of my character. It so developed that I was able to conduct very difficult pieces that an ordinary conductor could not conduct, but I failed in conducting regular repertory that anybody could conduct. Now, for instance, in modern composers, I found that I had to conduct different, uh, different uh, times with right and left hand. Nobody could, could do that. And so I can show it to you how it was. If you, if you f follow my left hand, you'll find that there will be four beats, or rather four bars, and only against three bars in the right hand like this. And then together. So I could also, in another piece, did five, eight against uh, against two, like this. Now, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, with my right hand. And only two with my left hand. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. One. Now, this obviously created a sensation for myself. Now, actually, I don't know of anyone who tried to do that. And then all of a sudden, I discovered that I could do anything. Slonimsky almost single-handedly brought the then unknown modern American and European composers of the 1930s to a resisting public. The music was difficult to conduct and to play, and challenged many listeners beyond their tolerance. Well, anyway, after that, I began getting engagements because I could conduct Ives and Varese and Cowell and various other com composers whom nobody would touch with, with a 10-foot pole. Well, I wouldn't say that. And so, uh, and then uh, all those composers became interested in, in uh, uh, sponsoring me because Ives could not get any performances at all. And so, so I got a performance in Paris sponsored by Charles Ives who had money and he simply gave me money to, uh, to arrange an orchestra in Paris which I immediately went, that was in 19, 1931. And they would say, well, who is that guy? And he conducts those pieces. We don't even know how, uh, who those people are, who those composers are. And all of a sudden, I made a hit. So now I was, I was great, I mean. Slonimsky conducted the premiere and first recording of Edgard Varese's percussion work, Ionization. In order to perform Ionization, I had to en enlist people who are, were not performers on special instruments, because let's not forget that Ionization was written only for instruments of percussion and uh, some sirens. <laughs> Juarez was convinced that he was ahead of his time. And amazingly enough, he was right. You see, like everybody said, you are not ahead of your time. You just don't know how to compose. And it turned out that now those pieces are regular concert pieces. It 
the uh, atomic engineers who worked on the bomb actually used my recording of ionization by Varez as a sort of a uh, uh, inspiration for them to find how to to uh, split the atom. Suddenly desert sands near Alamogordo, New Mexico disappear beneath castles of clouds rising from this first atomic blast. After the success of ionization in pre-war Europe, Slonimsky was invited to conduct the Hollywood Bowl Symphony. Well, that was a critical reaction. And you see, the critical reaction was this. I mean, there was, uh, there was a group of people who thought that it was wonderful, particularly John Cage, who was a young man then, and he told me that he attended every single performance uh, that I conducted any of the new American uh, music. Those concerts that he conducted in the uh, Hollywood Bowl were a great experience for me. They gave such a, a wide and rich view of um, 20th century music. And the 20th century was quite young then. But there were also uh, old dowagers who gave money to the, to, the, uh, to the Hollywood Bowl, and all of a sudden they were confronted with something called ionization. That they didn't know what it meant. You, you see, those concerts were not popular. They, they were rather, um, as I say, statements of belief. The people who, who, who attended them uh, wanted to attend them and were uh, hanging, so to speak, on each thing that happened, waiting for each sound. So finally, uh, they decided they didn't want any of my performances, and so that was that. Was that. Those uh, concerts in the Hollywood Bowl were instrumental in changing my, my life. The bad reviews and the flight of puzzled and indignant audience members resulted in an inglorious end to my conducting career, wrote Slonimsky in his autobiography. The word spread that I was a dangerous musical revolutionary who inflicted hideous noise on concert goers expecting to hear beautiful music. With the demise of his conducting career, Slonimsky laid down the baton and picked up the pen. He distinguished himself with a succession of written works. His history, music since 1900, the witty and irreverent lexicon of musical invective, his influential thesaurus of scales and melodic patterns, his reference and reader's guide to musical terminology, the lectionary of music, and his autobiography, written at the age of 94, perfect pitch, which of course he has. And through it all, edition after weighty edition, eight in all, of Baker's Biographical Dictionary of Musicians, the consummate musical reference work. Baker was uh, a guy who lived in Boston and who at the age of uh, 25 decided to put together a dictionary and he filled this dictionary with a lot of unnecessary uh, entries which I had to eliminate. So this is what happened to the original Baker who actually existed but he shouldn't have existed because mixed up many things but anyway but the dictionary Baker's biographical dictionary remained and that's how uh, how I became the editor of Baker's biographical dictionary of musicians. Baker's was not Slonimsky's only child. He married the art critic Dorothy Adlo and had one daughter named with characteristic Slonimsky wit Electra. 
Well, you see, I, unfortunately, my wife died 25 years ago. And so, but I have a daughter, and then I also have a grandson and a granddaughter. So this is enough. How but of course, I would like to have uh, a wife if I had a wife as wonderful as the one who unfortunately passed away 25 years ago. I became an American citizen in 1931, and then I was able to go back to Russia in a new shape as, 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 as an American. And then, of course, I met all my friends and everybody. They all looked more depressed and perhaps even frightened. I felt that there are certain things that could not be done and that there were certain composers who were discriminated against because at that time there was a beginning of, of pressure and uh, perhaps even terror on the part of the Stalin government. Now, for instance, you can say anything you want about St. Petersburg, about Russia in general, about Ukraine, about anything at all, and, and even uh, read foreign papers. See, that, that's new. It was not possible at that time. Well, I, I felt that it was a return of the native. And so I was native, and it was uh, really redound to me to, to visit the place in which I spent practically all my youth. This is really my, my place in the world, if there is any. Places which I knew so well as a child, and to measure whether it was like this. Now, Nevsky Prospect, of course, is the main artery in uh, St. Petersburg, and that I remembered very well. It's a little bit like Fifth Avenue in New York. City had changed because it had become smaller. I mean, not actually. I mean, it was a, it was a wonderful uh, avenue of things, and uh, that had. Uh, to me, as a, as a child, a, a feeling of uh, luxury and uh, perhaps something that I could never attain in my life, so I thought. And now it's a little bit shabby, and I uh, could, could not regain that sense of, of youthful delight. The Russians, who were always art lovers, managed to restore their treasures and there's, as far as I could uh, feel, no great uh, works of art had been destroyed. Then, of course, the Russian music remained great music. During his visit, Slonimsky and his family attended the 105th performance of the opera Mary Stuart, written by the popular Russian composer of symphonies and operas, Sergei Slonimsky, Nicholas Slonimsky's nephew.
this I recognize. This Mary Stewart, uh, this is an opera by my nephew, Sergei Slonimsky. Mary Stuart is the story of the historic confrontation between Mary, Queen of Scots, and Queen Elizabeth I for the throne of England. Though not overtly, its popularity may be due in part to the opera's central conflict, a conflict that mirrors Russia's continuing political power struggles. Mary's arrest, the celebration of Elizabeth's subjects, the anguish of Mary's subjects, and finally her execution are seen through distinctly Russian eyes. The St. Petersburg International Music Festival, for which Slonimsky had returned, was the focal point of his visit, a week-long series of performances and seminars at concert halls throughout the city. One of the many festival events was a performance of Slonimsky's piano work 51 Minitudes at the St. Petersburg Composers' Union. Nikolai Slonimsky, Sesha, 20 pies is cycle Minitudes. Never a prolific composer, but a self described miniaturist, Slonimsky's 51 Minitudes is made up of short, discreet, playful piano movements. Oh, this is my piece. Ta 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 ta. That's my composition, played by a remarkable young Russian pianist. Very well played.
wonderful playing, much better than I could ever play my own pieces. In December of 1956, celebrity Franz Leninsky as a quiz show contestant on the short-lived The Big Surprise, hosted by a young Mike Wallace. Unfortunately, the footage of Slonimsky's appearance on the program has been lost. Slonimsky's category was not music as you might expect, but misinformation. All right, Mr. James Colvin of Encyclopedia Britannica, may I have the $30,000 question? I have it here. After three wildly popular appearances, to the audience's surprise, Slonimsky did not go for the big $100,000 payoff. He stopped at the $30,000 plateau, only to discover on the air that he knew all the answers to the $100,000 questions. Make this a day you never will regret this. Here is your chance. Make this 
once a day. A new type toothpaste has been created. The name of it. As irreverent as his Etude à la Ronge, Slonimsky's advertising songs are a brazen send-up of slogans and ad copy of the 1930s, taken directly from the pages of the popular magazines of the day. You never will regret it. Make this a day of Pep's event. Make this a day of Pep's event. children cry for Castoria. Children cry for Castoria. Yes, they cry for Castoria. Mother, relieve your constipated child. Hurry, mother, even a fretful, feverish, bilious child loves the pleasant taste. Castoria, 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 oh gentle, harmless laxative, which never fails to sweeten the stomach and open the bowels. It never cramps or relaxes, it tastes no narcotics of sweet drugs. Ask your druggists for general Castoria. All the instructions are printed on the bottle. Children cry for Castoria. Yes, they cry for Castoria. Slonimsky and Cage seem made for each other, each struggling to come to terms with the modern movement in their unique and individual ways. He seems to uh, make everyone around him happy and, and, and often laughing. And his own, his own music is, uh, can arouse laughter particularly if he sits with his back to the piano and plays something on the, on the keyboard. But his music, besides being, um, you could say, mirthful or humorous, is, is also inventive. I, I, I can't imagine that Soninsky takes uh, seriously the idea of, of being a genius. Maybe having to be one is what has produced this marvelous, lively sense of humor that uh, he carries with him wherever he goes. An entire generation of young musicians, many of them from the world of rock, have rediscovered Slonimsky on his home turf of Los Angeles and sought him out, inspired by his thesaurus of scales. Hello, Nicholas. Good to see you. Well, it's wonderful to see you and to feel you. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to mention uh, such matters. That's but okay. You, I know where you're coming you, uh, from. You first things first. Because I, uh, yeah. wrong, you this know. is the 90s. It's <laughs> hair before yeah, music. Right, exactly. Well, anyway, let's not talk this way because I'm liable to say something that would be unprintable. <laughs> That's what editing is for. Jennifer bought four copies of this book, which increases my receipts. <laughs> Considerably, but this book is very, very amusing. It scares the most word. people. You're quite a showman, Nicholas. Well, yes. It was the music of Verez that brought rock iconoclast Frank Zappa and Nicholas Slonimsky together. Their mutual affection ran deep, as this last interview Zappa granted for this production attests. Just a brilliant mind. And it's a very warm-hearted spirit. These are qualities not often found linked together in human beings. And I just liked him. One of the things I really liked about him was the wardrobe. 
I was impressed with his wardrobe from the first day he came over because he had that look. He had the, the look of a real guy from that era. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The right kind of shoes, the right kind of tweed, rumpled, worn for a thousand years kind of sport coat. And, Pants too short. He was wonderful. He was a fully developed character. Slonimsky's nephew, Sergei Slonimsky, has spent his entire life in St. Petersburg. A well known composer of symphonies and operas within Russia, he is little known outside its boundaries. Sergei and his wife, Raya, welcome their uncle to the apartment that has been in the Slonimsky family for more than a hundred years. Nicholas Slonimsky came to St. Petersburg by invitation of the Composers' Union with his daughter Electra to participate in the International Music Festival. Slonimsky is one of the most famous and greatest of first wave emigres to the United States. Nicholas responds, I never forget Russia. <laughs> Many more.
I have more hair than Sergei, or maybe, maybe it's the... And Nikolai Leonidovich Slonimsky, a legendary Russian American musicologist of manifold endeavors, born uh, in St. Petersburg on April. 27th, 1894, a self-described failed wunderkind. Everybody told me that I was a wunderkind, that is child prodigy. But then at the age of seven and or eight, I found out that there were other wunderkinds who, who were smarter than I was. Let me ask you, if you had any one thing to do over, what would that be? to be someone else except myself. Really? Yes. Why is that? Well, because I'm sick, sick and tired of being myself and being told that I was wonderful when I knew I wasn't wonderful. On his last day in St. Petersburg, Nicholas Slonimsky searched for his childhood home. Help me. I think that I, I have a pretty complete memory of you. The city was greatly changed. Memory proved fickle, but finally... This is my home. This is my home. Many years ago, I lived here, on the second floor. Now I have reached the age of absurdity, wrote Slonimsky in his autobiography. To exorcise the ghostly digits of my age, I have now adopted a personal countdown, modulo 100. It works like this. In 1990 he was four, in 1991 he was three. In 1994, he wrote, I will be zero. On this hopeful note, I conclude.